your field of interest then is is about you know pulling people out of the rabbit hole like de-radicalizing people and i don't know if de-radicalizing is the right word yeah. well yeah we, we do some of that you know I've, I've i've sort of shifted a lot of my focus on um on prevention given how difficult it is to pull people out of rabbit holes but certainly i, I interview a lot of people who are former extremists and conspiracy theorists but we also you know we do sort of research on why people believe these things what are the predictors and how does the you know, mind work when when people believe in what what are seemingly outrageous theories, and um, and then can we design real interventions to to try to prevent it from happening to regular people? And then we also see okay, what effect might this have on people who are already kind of playing around with these ideas? And then sometimes mm-hmm. we need more aggressive sort of de-radicalization interventions for people who are deep down the rabbit hole. Although, you know, it's very difficult to to do that. In fact, I have some interesting questions for you about your experiences with uh with that. But maybe yeah, maybe uh I don't know, maybe we could start off oh. with uh with, with your what what was the the motivation behind uh uh things fell apart for you? Um so for me obviously I'm interested in the the, the conspiratorial element and the disinformation, but you talk a lot about culture wars. Um and so I, I thought mm. it was interesting uh to to sort of hear a little bit about what motivated uh you I, I saw a little clip between you and uh, and, and Louis um, um, with a little bit about Robbie Williams that I thought was really interesting uh, um, as well, uh, maybe for, for people. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure if that was the catalyst for, for the show, but um, uh, yeah, I was just curious. It, yeah, it wasn't the catalyst. I, I, so, I, so during lockdown, yeah, Rob contacted me to say that he... The thing I really like about Robbie is, is that he you know, always stay healthily has a foot in both camps. Like, like he's right. willing to go down rabbit holes, but there's always, he's always got one foot in the world of scepticism and, uh-huh. and uh, you know, which I think is a very healthy way of living your life. Sure. Um, so he, yeah, he contacted me during lockdown and said that, um, yeah, he's got interested in QAnon and the thing, I can't remember whether I said this to Louis or not, but the thing that I remember that really made me laugh was he said, you know, I'm, you know, I don't know whether to believe or not. He said, like, I've read some stuff that, that says that, you know, I, meaning him, you know, that I am, you know, part of the paedophile cabal. And I know that's not true about me, but, uh, you know, right. how do I know it's not true about Bill Gates? So right. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was very funny. Um, okay. I, and uh, anyway, nothing came of it. I, I think he was... Oh. Nothing came of it, but we had to like, you know, a number of calls and FaceTimes about it. And in fact, I didn't really know much about QAnon uh, because I'd done all of that. I, you know, I'd, I'd written my book then way back in 2000. So when QAnon began to emerge, I thought, oh, well, I've already done this. You know, I don't need to, right. you know. Um, but then at the same time, the BBC approached me and said, was I interested in doing something about the culture wars? And really what motivated me to say yes was just seeing friends, you know, what what we were just talking about, seeing friends plummeting down rabbit holes in a way that was felt, you know, disproportionate, you know, really deleterious to their their well-being. and I was really interested in the kind of mechanics of that, uh, just just like you, like what yeah. what are the you know, and it seemed to be happening more than ever. Um, you know, it seemed like more and more people were talking about losing people to, you know, QAnon or whatever culture war it was, yeah, yeah. and people just changing and like you know, you'd hear over and over again people said, you know, between this tweet and that tweet two weeks later they seem to be a completely different person. So, you know, yeah. that mm-hmm. so that was the reason why I wanted to do it, was to try and figure yeah, out, absolutely. you know, the mechanics of all of that. It's like how, how you know, what, 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 what does happen to somebody between that tweet and that tweet two weeks later when they seem to be unrecognisable or mm-hmm. an extreme caricature of themselves? So, so that was why. Yeah, that's fascinating. In terms of, you know, outlining people's journey, certainly during the pandemic, yeah, I've had, you know, I've had, Family members who are deeply embroiled in 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 conspiracy theories and who got further radicalized during the pandemic, and um, you know, mm. people have obviously yeah. died because they believe in in conspiracy theories. Um, 
But maybe before we get into into maybe this the sort of psychology nitty gritty of it, um, I, I did have sort of a uh, you know a side question that I was just fascinated by when I was listening to uh, to the show. Um, um, you know, what, how do you get people to agree uh, to come on the show? And so one of the things that that um, you know in the scientific community that's a real challenge is you know. Conspiracy theorists, they don't want to participate in scientific research. So even when we say we just want to hear your thoughts, we want to get inside your mind, you know, very empathetic to your situation. Um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, it's in the public interest to, to have this knowledge out there, um, non-confrontational. You know, they just don't trust scientists. They don't trust scientific institutions. Mm -hmm. It's very it's very difficult um, to, to recruit um, um, people in the scientific uh, research. Um, and mm. you know, it's, it's, uh, the same. Uh, so you had this, this, uh, this final bit with, uh, after the first season, I think with Louis Theroux, um, on, um, uh, talking about, um, which I found really interesting. I didn't know your, uh, your frenemy sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of, sort of past, but, <laughs> but, 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 but what struck me is, um, you know, people must see his shows and still they, they agree to come on. And I felt similar with your podcast, mm. you know, you do try to stand up for the facts uh throughout the show right and, and give people sense of what the science actually says so so they know hmm. that you know they're they're, they're not going to come out of this looking like the hero of the of the story um so what what was your experience did you get any harassment after i mean i get this all the time you know not not maybe not mariana spring level but but certainly you know i get hmm. i get you know a lot of a lot of hate mail about doing this type of uh of research right. You know, I don't, I, and and I'm very like touch wood. It never starts because I, I think it would be very upsetting if you know if I if I got that kind of um, you know negative feedback. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't, and I think okay. I think the main reason. Well, I think there's a few answers to the question. Firstly, I actually think the the fact that it's the BBC and in America the BBC is still held in you know, in, in, in high regard. And, right. and on the rare occasions we were turned down because we were considered to, you know, establishment. I was just going to um, say, it was from, yeah. yeah. The well, sheeple. exactly. You know, on, on the very, very rare occasions that that was a, you know, problem, it was, it was Brits. It was, a, it was, um, you know, I think Americans still feel a sense of you know the BBC being less partisan than you know than a lot of the American media, and and it and it is you know the the American mm -hmm. media, the BBC is far from perfect. I think you know none, none of the old legacy, you know institutions are perfect, but I think that the BBC is, but you know works far harder at being nonpartisan than some than, other, um... than a lot of the. Yeah, than a lot of the American media, you, oh, you know, I think the American media prides itself on being partisan. You know, see, well, you know, MSNBC and CNN right. and Fox. You know, they they pride themselves on on being partisan. CNN slightly less so than before. So that was one reason. Um, another reason is just you know my my you know if I'm doing the approaches, I'm just very very curious, and 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 so by the time you know I'm, I'm enthusiastically curious, and I think that rubs off on people. Um, and, and also, I'm not an ideological person. I, I tend to, you know, tend to take ideology out of the equation when yeah. I'm doing storytelling. So I'm meeting people just where they are. I'm meeting people, you know, and I think people appreciate that. But yeah, I always do bring, like, I'm not going to give somebody like Judy Mikovits, you know, an easy ride, because there is a danger to saying that, you know, that some of the things that she says. So, um well, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna jump to that because um, I think what you yeah. said resonates well with, um, you know, when we build uh, interventions, for example, you know, games for the public and stuff. What we try to do is, um, you know, often we keep it non-political, uh, try to make the environment not so judgmental, to sort of like, oh, here's this elite institution mm -hmm. telling people the facts are. And we do feel, you know, we do find that people are more open and willing to engage, uh, you know, in that type of environment. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of mm -hmm. uh, you know interviewing extremists, uh, it's it's a it's a little bit more more challenging. But yeah, I was listening to the yeah. Judy uh, episode and uh, and especially the one with um, you know uh, with Mickey the producer, Willis. 
uh, Mickey Will, the producer of the of the of the of the show. And I was thinking, is 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 John going to challenge them? And how hard is he going to challenge them? And I was thinking about that because. <laughs> well, I, from... yeah, yeah, I think my answer is my answer is that yes, I will challenge them, but not that hard. <laughs> I, don't, yeah, that's... I don't think. Because <laughs> well, I just don't think it's my. Yeah, come. Yeah, no, no, your place. No, yeah, not... yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Now I was gonna. I was. I was yeah. gonna say. You know. From from the, from the sort of psychological research, we know that the people who are conspiracy theorists, you know, they they tend to double down when you challenge them too directly and too too hard. So they they get more extreme, um, and you don't, and nothing comes of it. You know, they they double down and they become defensive, and you know they and they you know more taciturn. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't do a sort of. You know, Jeremy Patterson Neil deGrasse Tyson style level grilling. debunk. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, huh? I, I don't. I just don't think it's my it's my purpose um, because then it becomes confrontational or oppositional, and when you do that, then you lose the curiosity and and you, and you don't really nothing. You know, I find that I. You know, if you go too heavy on that, it becomes about you. You know, it's all about you being the representative of righteous society. Um, I, I'm more interested in getting the interviewees to a place where they will talk in, in, in a sort of open and honest way that, um, yeah. uh, you know, that might give you some new insights on how society works, for instance. Whereas yeah. if I'm just sort of, ye you know, yelling at them about how they're wrong, nothing, you know, nothing... Productive you know, once in a while, yeah, yeah, once in a while, I think you have to do it. Like, you know, you, you have to challenge them on something if, if, if what they're saying is, you know, particularly dangerous or controversial or whatever, you have to do it. But it's yeah. certainly not the part of the process that I enjoy that, you know, it's it's my least favourite part of interviewing is having to confront yeah. people. And I, I got the sense that, you know, that, that you have the sort of feeling that it might flame the culture wars rather than ameliorate the, uh, the, the situation by going so heavy. But I was listening. It, well, it wouldn't do any good. I mean, I, well, this, I mean, this gets to your area, right? I mean, you know, you will, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I assume that in your research, you've never found it to work if you just like tell someone they're wrong. No, um, and, and we don't we don't advocate that with people who are on the more extreme side of uh, side of things. So that's that's exactly right. But it is sometimes strategically important for the bystanders and for the audience. So I think you you actually balance mm. it quite well because at some points you do fact check them, and I think it's really important mm. for the audience to be aware mm. of what the facts are um, because people might get confused if it's kind of an equal, yeah. you know, back and forth. Because everybody. You, I think uh, I think the uh, Mickey he was talking about sort of some of the AIDS uh, drugs at the time, and he said, "Oh, three three hundred thousand people have died from it." Um, and then I appreciate it. just just a segment later on, you, you went you went and fact checked that with a health economist who sort of a really interesting story, right? About that that was at the the peak of the uh, mm. the the sort of AIDS uh, crisis at the time, who who strongly AZT suggested, and... yeah, who strongly suggested yeah. that that's unlikely. Um, and then, um, yeah, his responses to you then were often like, "Oh, okay, well." Uh, and then, and then the mm. the segment skips to like the the next question you're going to ask them. Um, and so I feel like whenever you challenged them, there was not much of a response. There was just sort of recognition that you disagree because you basically say that you know that that's not congenial to the facts or the evidence. Um, yeah. And um, I was going to ask. I think it's about the, yeah. Well, I, I think it's. I think we get the balance pretty, pretty right. Like, yeah. you know, there's a lovely moment in in that particular episode where I say, I don't believe the vac You know, the vaccinations didn't kill millions. Exactly. And, uh, and there's this sort of awkward, you know, pretty long silence, and the two of us are pretty frosty with each other for for a moment. And I think you know that's enough. You know that that moment in the show that's enough. Um, it's. I don't need to do any more than that um, because I'm trying to get different things from them. And, I, you know, and if they become too defensive, they give a different kind of interview. I'm not saying they're going to shut up and not give you anything, but what they might do is give you just host hostile stuff and then it becomes a kind of hostile conversation. And you're, so you're seeing them angry 
And, you know, is that is that good? You know, is that good for, for your story is to just see them angry at you? Um, so, you know, you're weighing up all of these yeah. different questions. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds me, I'm not sure if, if you've ever seen this, um, um, going back to also to your convo with, uh, with, with Louis, he has this uh, episode where he's visiting these neo-Nazis and they start suspecting that he's Jewish at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he is. Yes. I'm Jewish. And so I was watching this and I was like, this is getting really awkward. And so they, they were like, wait, you know, you look Jewish. They started to get real aggressive. And he just has this sort of deadpan uh, act. I'm where not going to tell you if I'm Jewish or not. Yeah, he says, I'm yeah, not going to tell you And he leaves them Jewish in this sense of ambiguity and they get really angry and really riled up. Um, and I mm. see the camera team already kind of making their way uh, out, out the door. And I mean, you got to have some, I mean, it was it was some gumption to to just stand there. Um, but it was terrific. It does take it, it to was a, a different easy... level where they were shutting down and they were they were no longer wanting to talk to him. And and it's it's an interesting dynamic. So I was I was wondering if when you interview people, if if there's this awkwardness, do you feel sometimes that you have to pivot because they're shutting down or you, do you try to avoid kind of that level of confrontation? Um, <sighs> Well, I, 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 my, you know, when I was younger, I used to go for that, for awkwardness as a, <laughs> you know, my, my mm -hmm. early documentaries, you know, Top of yeah. Toller and, you know, right. um, you know, the things that comprise my book then, and even the documentaries I made before I wrote them, awkwardness was, was a big, was a big colour in my palette. Like I used to try and make things awkward. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, and and I really admire, you know, that thing you just mentioned about Louis. Um, you know, I really admired him doing that. But to be honest, I, I just kind of changed. And I thought, okay, you know, for years, I was this sort of slightly odd presence in documentaries making things awkward. Um, and people enjoyed it, and it was fun to watch. Mm -hmm. But I sort of felt like, I don't know, I want to... Um, that that only takes you so far. Whereas, I, and the other problem with it is that it, you know it's all about me. Like if I'm if I'm, you right. know, it becomes performative. Um, it doesn't really. It's not really journalism. It's more performance. So, but also, I'm I just don't like conflict, and I don't want to make people feel bad about themselves. And so I just sort of moved away from creating from that bit, yeah. But yeah, I really yeah quite a long time ago probably with the psychopath test actually was when i first started to really because my previous yeah because them and the men who stare at goats are much more you know about these awkward encounters yeah yeah well especially if you compare you know what's happening on social media often and then these sort of flame words and you compare it to the format of your show you're you're really getting them to sort of talk about stuff um, quite, yeah. I mean, they're saying in a serious tone, quite ridiculous things, but but in a safe sort of environment, and you're being, you know, polite. You do sort of challenge and correct them. I I, I think mostly perhaps for the audience, uh, um, mm. rather than trying to change their minds. But but it's uh, yeah, it's a yeah. really it's a really good dynamic. And the yeah, and I should say BBC rules as well. Like there's you know the BBC does. I mean I'm not entirely sure what the rules are, but I do know that the BBC does have rules in place that you can't just allow certain things to go unchallenged. So I I sort of yeah. have to for BBC reasons too once in a while. But you know, luckily it doesn't really get to that very often. Most of the time, it's much more about. Um, you know, getting people, you know, being curious and getting people to open up because of your curiosity, as opposed to putting them in a corner and see how they yeah. react when they're in a corner. And yeah. threatening them. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, I knew, um, I knew a lot about the pandemic case because we did some research on what we call the, the sort of the seven trades of conspiratorial thinking, which is, you know, basically... Some reoccurring patterns that 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 are part of pretty much every conspiracy. Um, things like there's always some nefarious intention. There's some there's a victim in the story. There's the something must be wrong. Um, they're, they're often incoherent uh, things that don't really fit together. Um, and um, we use an acronym called Conspire to help people sort of spot these elements. And we did one on the pandemic. You know, for example, one of the incoherent things that Judy mentions is that you know you. Uh, um, you activate the virus with your mask that's already inside of you, but then also mm. um, um, 
somehow you're going to get ill from taking the vaccine. And so it's just it's just incoherent. Right? Either you already have the virus, uh, right, and you activate it, or um, you're um, you're getting uh, it from the from the vaccine. Um, but what I didn't mm -hmm. know about Mickey when I was when I was sort of listening to your episode was that he really his story is really fascinating. And I appreciate that you know you you sort of tell stories in in the show where it goes from his early days to pandemic. And I thought that was the peak, but no, it, it actually gets way, way more interesting uh, in terms of where he goes in, in endorsing. And that re actually reminded me of, um, of what we find in the literature, something called the sort of monological worldview, where, um, or the conspiratorial worldview, which is kind of a monological set of beliefs, meaning that, you know, if you believe in, in one conspiracy, it starts to serve as evidence for the existence of another conspiracy. And so the probability that you endorse multiple conspiracies goes up. Uh, quite radically, um, and it sort of becomes conditional almost. And it's like this sort of self-sealing worldview where, you know, there's always kind of a higher order conspiracy. Um, and it's very hard to break through that. So see, people start out with one, but then they see patterns in others, right? And then it's sort of, they become enthralled. Um, and I was just surprised that he went from, you know, trans to new world order to, to you know, and that video clip where he yeah. was encouraging his kids to be open about their sexuality and that now that was a big plot by trans people to sort of, it just it kind of fits with the <laughs> with the literature on yeah. like how how that actually works you know in my um one of the books i did on misinformation talk about this guy bucky wolf who was a man in seattle who thought his brother was a shape-shifting lizard and, and oh it and, killed and him decapitated him with a sword um yeah and so this was he was did, didn't he have psychosis that I, yeah, I, he was, I remember he had some psychosis, that. right? He was yeah. uh, he was not well mentally. Um, but interestingly, he was also a member of the Proud Boys, and he was also a member of QAnon. And so there's this sort of recurring sort of thing where it's never just about one conspiracy theory. It's 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 yeah. it often tends to be the case that one becomes the story for another. Uh, which becomes the basis for an even bigger conspiracy and that's kind of you know psychologically how people get sort of trapped in this in this worldview and then the question is how to how to get people out but i, I thought it was really interesting because yeah. the way that mickey his story evolves is exactly in that sequence where he becomes more and more radicalized and starts to see more patterns and and uh and it's yeah, all I part of an uber conspiracy near the end where you're sort of not thinking like come on now um but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it was. Um... Uh -huh. Do you feel no, that? That's um... right. Go ahead, sorry. Uh -huh. Well, um, I mean, I was interested in everything that you just said. I was. Let me just think where where I was going. Oh yeah, I was going to talk a little. I was going to ask you a little bit about paranoia. Um, did mm, you know, yeah. how, how much par paranoia plays in it? I noticed a couple of months ago. Um, I read this message that I got. And it was somebody, um, you know, I, I, and I thought, God, this message is like really, you know, passive aggressive. Why is this person being so, you know, weird towards me? And and mm -hmm. then I, yeah. and then I went back and looked at the message again a couple of months later for some reason, and the message was completely delightful. And like, no, you know, yeah. <laughs> every negative feeling I had about this message was entirely in my own mind. And that just made me think about how, you know, easily yeah. it is to slip into sort of paranoid thinking. And and um, yeah, so is paranoia a, a part of this? Yeah, that's a really interesting segue. And people don't realize this. I mean, academics, you know, we often joke about this too in some way because, um, you know, let's say when, when your paper gets rejected, even though the reviews are positive, you start thinking maybe there's some some plot happening where the editors are conspiring uh, against publishing your paper. There's actually a lot of this sort of low level uh, conspiracy theorizing that goes on for most people, in most settings, maybe at your job, you didn't get a promotion, you start thinking people are against you. Um, and it sort of relates to, to, to paranoia. Um, um, but, but yeah, paranoia is, it, 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 people have argued about whether paranoia and, and conspiracy theorizing are the same thing, but actually they're, con they're sort of conceptually different, but paranoia is a, is a major predictor of belief in conspiracy theories. I mean, there's a clinical element where people with paranoid schizophrenia, you know, have delusional conspiracy theories as a, you know, as a, as a clinical sort of symptom, but for the subclinical population, 
um, you know, just regular paranoia as, as a major predictor. So the scales that tap into that are like, do you think that often people are following you or do you think that, you know, people are out to get you? Whereas conspiracy theories, you know, the, the questions we ask are more about, you know, are governments plotting behind the scenes and, you know, is not everything, you know, is the, you know, the, the, the media is not telling us everything. And, 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 you know, do you think that it's possible that, um, you know, evil elites are 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 plotting, and it's kind of interesting because some people are like, okay, but evil elites are plotting behind the behind the scenes sometimes, right? And so, so it is, um, which is not mm. untrue, but it's it's more about the manifestation of uh, of of these sort of popular conspiracy theories. But yeah, okay. we looked at the study where on the relation between ideology and, and belief in conspiracy theories, because there's you know, a lot of debate about the right and the left and the differences. But one of the things we found was that the link between ideology and conspiracies is actually explained by by paranoia and uh, and mistrust so those things are actually much yeah. more proximal proximal so people who are really strong on distrust of official authorities of the media of mainstream institutions people are high on paranoia those are one of the two most important predictors of belief in conspiracy right. theories and when i was listening to the episode and narcissism yeah, yeah. yeah. what about, what about yeah. narcissism yeah, yeah narcissism is a, is a go ahead well, yeah, I've always thought narcissism was a big part of it for, for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, because of this sort of nature of um, when when people with narcissistic disorders get wounded, they tend to, you know, tell me if I'm wrong about anything I'm mm. saying here. Um, they tend to, you know, the wound doesn't heal at all or very well so they tend to lash out and lash out and lash out you know they're they're not good at getting over being slighted and i think you know some leaders have you know so then somebody yeah. like Naomi, Naomi well i'm not by any i'm not saying Naomi wolf is i have no idea if Naomi wolf has yeah, yeah. or not but, but this idea of Naomi wolf being excluded from her community um you see this happening all the time i know people you know, gender critical people who are excluded mm -hmm. from their community and then right. double down and double down and, you know, and so, you know, this relationship between, you know, if somebody who, who is narcissistically inclined then has a, you know, get, you know, is, is shamed or, you know, and, and sort of excluded, I, I've always thought that's one reason why they might turn to conspiracies. And I think the other connection between narcissism and conspiratorial thinking is just that narcissists don't care as much about whether something's true or not than, than non-narcissists do because they're wrapped up in themselves and truth only matters in relation to their place in the world. Do, do you think those things are true? Everything I yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's really interesting what you said because, you know, narcissism in a way, it, it's, uh, you know, a lot of this is about how motivated people are by accuracy. Uh, you know, we, we we can all be, you know, experimentally, we can induce, uh, you know, in a typical experiment where we ask partisans some questions about misinformation, they'll give us not so great answers. Uh, but then if we start paying people for the right answer, all of a sudden they know the, the, the right answer. So with the right incentives, you can actually make people a lot more accurate. Um, and I think narcissism is a major distractor. Uh, in terms of being accurate, because as you said, it, it's all about self-obsession. It's looking inward. It's uh, it's and, and there's a sort of, you know, m marginal relationship to what's true. It's more about, you know, how am I advancing my own interests? So that's so that's true. And then mm -hmm. the other thing I think you said relates to this sort of difference between vulnerable. It's called vulnerable narcissism to the sort of grandiose type of of narcissism. So some right. narcissists are like more vulnerable and they get wounded. And that kind of motivates them, as you were saying, whereas others are you know maybe maybe Trump is more of the example of the grandiose type of narcissism where you know where grandiosity is is the main kind of motivator for that type of of narcissism. Um, but yeah, there's right. tons of research on narcissism and belief in conspiracy theories. Um, so absolutely, that's a that's another major predictor. Um, and then there's contextual things: how much time people spend on social media, um, it, you know, where they get their news from, um, how cognitively flexible people are. So we did some research on this, and I found this fascinating, is that um, this concept called actively open-minded thinking, which is about, you know, can you hold multiple hypotheses in your mind? Are you open to uncertainty? Is it okay to not have all the answers? Uh, are you willing to take mm. somebody else's perspective? You know, people who are high on that level of flexibility 
are very much protected from believing in, in conspiracy theories and misinformation. People who are low on that, so they tend to be very rigid cognitively. They can't really, you know, they want things to be certain. They want a single explanation. They want clear causal, uh, you know, effects. Uh, they can't really handle uh, ambiguity. Um, those people are more ideologically extreme and also more likely to endorse sort of extremist uh, ideas. Um, that's another kind of major component of of that type of thinking, uh, and that's not so right. easily that's not so easily addressed. You can't just teach people to be open minded. It turns out, um, and mm -hmm. so that that um that that is actually much more difficult than um than we thought. But um yeah, absolutely. That, that's I think mm -hmm. that's that's all part of it. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, and my other question for you then is, and this is like such an important question. Um, so a couple, you know, as we know, it's really, really hard for people once they're down the rabbit hole to find their way out again. And some people probably never get out. You know, I've got friends or former friends who fell down rabbit holes of their particular yeah. culture war, and I'm not sure they'll ever get out. Like they seem so in deep that I can't imagine I, th I think this is it for the rest of their lives now. However, I've met a few people, a small number of people over the years who have completely changed. And one was this guy called Josh Owens, who, uh, so I met him in 2016 at the Republican convention in Cleveland. Uh -huh. And he was Alex Jones's cameraman. And, uh, and he was spent, wow. but I noticed he was spending like, quite a lot of time with me like whenever I bumped into him at the convention center or whatever mm -hmm. he was hanging out with me and not with Alex and Alex's friends even though he was there you know working with Alex mm -hmm. and uh, eventually and I could tell that you know there was something on his mind and eventually I met him you know after the convention I think I met him on inauguration day and he told me basically that um, he'd been working with Alex for four years Wow. He's really disillusioned. You know, he was such a huge Alex Jones fan. I think he even won a competition to work for Infowars, and he'd worked there for like four years, and he'd become completely disillusioned and, you know, wanted out. So I did a, I did a little thing with him for This American Life, and also um, I hooked him up with an editor that I knew at the New York Times magazine, uh -huh. and he ended up writing a kind of a big piece for the New York Times magazine about, you know, I worked for Alex Jones and now I regret it. So and you can see that that piece where he talks about his whole, you know, sort mm -hmm. of arc going from being an Alex Jones fan to a whistleblower in the New York Times. And then I and I was interviewed quite recently by this podcast called Some Dev Call It Conspiracy, these these guys. From uh, Brent Lee. I was going to mention Brent, yeah. Yeah, so similarly, you know, they're people who were big Alex Jones fans and they found their way out as well so what is it so you know so yeah. what is it about Josh and the, some dare call it conspiracy guys why were they different to to people who um can't get out of the rabbit hole and also I assume that Josh I assume that the one thing that they have in common is nobody forced them out of the rabbit hole they found their way out by themselves. It was a self-motivated. Um, that's a, yeah, thing. yeah. That, that's a great um, insight, actually, because I think all the examples we hear about are sort of self-motivated. There's a selection bias there, right? We only hear from the from the people who got out. Um, and yeah, I know I've interviewed yeah. um, um, people like that. One, one chap called Caleb Kane in in, uh, in the US who, who fell into the YouTube rabbit hole, some former, you know, neo-Nazis. Um, I talk a lot with Brent, who has also a really interesting story. Um, um, I think there's there's not a extremely clear common thread here, but but there are from there are, there are a few ways people get out. Um, and then I think you know we've developed this particular approach, which doesn't directly address the issue, but but it does so in an indirect way, which which I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll come back to. But the the mm -hmm. I think the main thing for um. For example, Caleb, who who watched you know tens of thousands of hours of radicalizing YouTube videos, you know he came. It was it was more that it wasn't planned, as you said. So he came across, um, you know, he's watching these sort of right wing, uh, extremely misogynistic uh, sort of videos, and then there's this influencer. I'm not sure if you if you if you know her called Natalie Wynn. She's the the Oscar Wilde of oh yeah, contrapoints. Yeah. Contrapoints. That's right. 
But how? In did fact, you... she. Uh, funnily enough, I I was um, when my wife was away a couple of nights ago. I started watching some ContraPoints videos and I, and, and I got a name check in one of them. So, and, and it just came, I was oh, just there you go. happily watching away and then and suddenly uh, she's quoting from one of my books. So, That's fantastic, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, she's... so I was, I was flattered. Uh -huh. And I thought it was extremely interesting material. And what she does is this, uh, what some people sort of, sort of refer to as algorithmic hacking. So she does, you know, she talks about the same issues as what the radicalizers talk about so that they get the same key words, so that her content shows up in the feed of the extremists, and it's called ContraPoints. Oh. And so, so, that's, so that's how people then sort of, and it's interesting for, for YouTube and places like Google to learn about this, because they have this program called Redirect, which is how they can redirect people after they watch extremist videos to something that is a, is a quote unquote ContraPoint. Um, and so that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of how it was for Caleb, and he started watching, and he was like, wait a second, you know, uh, and then he started watching more alternative viewpoints and um, and slowly, slowly got out. I think for Brent, it was different. I mean, he sort of mentioned that, um, you know, with the whole QAnon thing, it just became so implausible that he thought, well, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to start questioning some of the things that, you know, he was a big David Icke fan, Alex Jones, right? And so, but but it just became so bizarre that uh, there there seems to be a limit. Um, so there's this concept in, in uh, informally in psychology we call crank magnetism, uh, which is that strange ideas attract each other. Um, so people who believe in spirituality are also into alternative medicine, who are also into pseudoscience, magical thinking, and it's this whole sort of bubble that surrounds people. Um, but but it was too. But some things don't fit, um, and so there's this sort of um, um, con contrasting effect where if the ideas are too extreme, too strong, then all of a sudden people. Sort of people think, well, what's going on here? And there's actually an intervention called paradoxical thinking, which I think is kind of interesting, where we sort of take an issue to such an extreme level that people say, no, no, that's 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 too much. Um, so an example that they they tested is in the context. This was before the war, actually, in in, in Gaza. But so it's it's a bit of a weird example now. But but basically, they wanted to 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 get Israelis to to, to maybe be a bit you know less prejudice towards Palestinians. And so they started taking pro-Israel arguments to, to a crazy extreme. So they said, okay, so what do you think we should do? And said, well, maybe Palestinians should just find their own place to live. And then said, great, um, can you give some points for how we're gonna make that happen tomorrow? Should we just all put them in a different country? Should we blow, you know, should, which is now kind of inappropriate to sort of cover, but they gave these sort of crazy examples. And all of a sudden people say, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. Let me rethink my position. Actually, it's not that bad. Um, and so, and so right. they actually got less extreme. Um, and so maybe some of that happened to Brent, where, where the conspiracies just went so bizarre that he just said, like, that's that's too much. I need to distance myself from it. But here's the important that's point a... for me. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Josh, who used to be Alex's cameraman, for him, I think it's similar. For him, it was, for him, I don't know if this was the only reason, but certainly a, a big reason was Islamophobia. Um, Alex, you mm. know, never used to talk about I mean you know with Alex's early days it was all about the new world order it was all about you know heavy-handed government Waco Ruby Ridge you know xenophobia and Islamophobia and so on see I think came in a little bit later and this is certainly what Josh says to me that that you know he found himself he had to go to upstate New York where there was this Muslim community and Alex wanted him to do a report about them they were all secret terrorists and it was a terrorist training camp and um and josh said that on, on his way back he was on a plane and he was sitting next to a muslim family and he was just feeling just incredible guilt like this isn't why i wanted to work for infowars it wasn't it was never about the muslims yeah, and right yeah yeah so that i think that so i think that was a big moment for for josh yeah, that's yeah. interesting. And there's some parallels, I think, with Brent, because he does talk about, you know, how damaging some of these theories are to, to people. And that makes people feel bad once they realize that they're endorsing something that's actually harmful. But I think for me, the, the big differentiator between prevention and, and de-radicalization is, is for people who are radicalized. And this is why I think there are the exceptions is because, you know, Brent lost all of his friends. Uh, he had no social network. I mean, it takes a lot of bravery. You have to be you have to be strong for that. And for most people, that's just not an option. So what you see in a lot of de-radicalization 
it, is that it requires you have to give people a new social network. You have to give people, you know, different, you know, they have to have access to different type of friends. They have to have social support. Uh, it, it has to be a continued conversation, right? It, it's, it's not going to happen over one one night or one day. You have to keep talking to people. You have to be supportive. Um, you know, they have to have resources to get away. You know, if, if you take this, if you look at cults, for example, um, they need a lot of a lot of support, logistical, social. Um, and that's mm -hmm. just not easy to do. Um, and um, that's why I think it's so hard for people to to get out of these things. Um, and that's, you know, the playbook. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we look at um, how people get radicalized, for example. Um, one of the, the, the playbook is find vulnerable individuals, people who are in a personal life crisis, who don't have any research. Maybe they they flunked out of school. They don't have a job at the moment. Find someone who's vulnerable, gain their trust. Um, isolate them from their friends and family and then activate them to do something little for the cause. And then you go on to become extreme. And they, um, you know, they, they use this playbook. Um, so I think that's part of it. And so, but then we started thinking about this, a different type of solution, which is why kind of how we arrived at this notion of pre-bunking or inoculation, which, um, you know, I stress a lot, including mm -hmm. with a lot of colleagues from the BBC. And it's all about this idea. It's kind of strange. Instead of fact checking here, the idea is to actually give people a weakened dose of the virus um and uh and and deconstruct it in advance so that you know when it actually happens to people they're they're immune kind of like giving people a vaccine so when we started doing this mm -hmm. 10 years ago people were very confused about this idea of this of giving people a weakened version of a conspiracy and then deconstructing it in advance and then testing people with the full dose a bit later on because it seems kind of uncomfortable but that was kind of the idea that you know simulating the types of ideological or cultural war attacks that people might be facing in the future simulating that in weakened form and allowing people to build up resistance through counter argumentation and counter evidence and finding their own sort of ways of of uh of resisting it uh turns out to be mm -hmm. you know uh, uh pretty uh, pretty strong and and um you know we do stuff on social media like with little videos with with uh, youtube for example we try to you know go, going back to our initial conversation we try to keep it light and keep it fun and not tell people what to believe or what to do but you know, we show people a clip from, um, are you a Star Wars fan? John Rhys is not going to land at all with the. So um, in, no, I've never, um, no, no, I've never watched the Star Wars film. Okay. We have this on record. So, John, when you're transcribing this, I think we should include that uh, never, never watched a, a Star Wars film. I watched, but, uh, I watched the very first one in, I okay. think, what, 1977 it came out? Yeah, yeah, something um, like that, yeah. Yeah, and my parents took me to the Odeon in Cardiff to see the very first Star Wars. And everybody in the cinema was like, you know, clearly thinking this was like the greatest moment of their, of their lives. And it just sort of slightly, you know, whooshed past me like a spaceship. Literally. Yeah. And I've never, I never tried to watch anymore. Ironically, ironically, um, the two actors who have played versions of me in movies have both been Star Wars people, uh, Ewan McGregor. And oh, Donald wow, Gleason. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I always thought that was quite funny that people who've played such, you know, fabulous mythological characters um have yeah. also had to play the goats. Um Ewan McGregor in the Medisteric yeah. Goats yeah. and Donald Gleason, Donald Gleason in Frank, a, a film okay. about um in fact, about you know, being in an avant garde band with a singer who wears a big fake head. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's By the way, I just want to interrupt it. I want to hear the Star Wars thing, but I just want to go back and say one thing that I forgot. Yeah, go when he said that Brent, when he said that Brent lost all of his friends, um, what what a reminder is when Josh um, wrote his piece in the New York Times about you know I used to work for Alex Jones and now I regret it. I looked at the comments and like so you know the the great majority of the comments were you know, fuck you, I don't forgive you, you should never have worked for Alex Jones to begin with, don't wow, come yeah. bleating to yeah. us now. So, wow. you know, so it wasn't, you know, so actually you can piss off everybody if you, <laughs> you know. If, you know, if you're not I, careful. I, I thought, yeah, well, I thought the comments, um, you know, on, on Josh's piece were completely inappropriate and, you know, elitist and, you know, it's like, you know, this guy's just done something incredibly brave yeah. and all you New York Times readers are just going to attack him for for making a mistake in the past. It's like, it, you know. That's a terrible response. I think it it, it, it leads people to, to to then, you know, retreat or or even go back in some of these circles. Absolutely. They, they don't have an alternative. And 
I think often, you know, totally. Political... I, I, yeah. when I was, let me say, I don't I want to go put the table. You can no, say, no, no. yeah. When I was, when, well, when I was writing, so you can perfectly shamed, I was very aware of of the fact that you know when somebody, when some kid, um, you know, makes some mistake, uh, tweets something unwise, the left pile in on them. I don't think this happens anymore, but it was happening huge style, you know, ten years ago. Um, who was waiting with open arms saying, come to us? But the 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 right, people like Milo Yiannopoulos, like, we're not going to judge you, come to us. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Anyway. I think I think I think the left is uh it's still I think that still happens. And uh it's not it's not a strategic, it's not a good response. You know, I've always said, for example, I did some some work on, on climate sort of uh uh disinformation and conspiracy theories. It's you know, when when you have Prominent Republicans like Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or you know other Republicans who are who are speaking out about climate, even though it's not as as, as you know as far as you want them to go, this should be celebrated, not not you know accuse them or ridicule them because then we're not going to have any bipartisan support because yeah. you know they just realize yeah. that they're not getting rewarded for going against their own group in some way. So so it's right. It's, you know, well, yeah. I mean, maybe this is the difference between, you know, maybe this is a sort of progressive versus more classical liberal or libertarian perspective that progressives want to, to make people behave in, in a certain way, more so than, than other political, you know. I think so. And, and often they, they want it all and they want it now. And I think I see this a lot with, with misinformation, that they want people to be fixed. They want them to endorse the facts now. And it's sort of it's it's just it doesn't happen that way. We've got to be patient. Uh, you know, de-radicalization happens in slow steps. We've got to be supportive. And I think that's the um, you know, that's the even on social media, that's not how it plays out. It's it's you know, it's debunking and flame wars. And um, but I, unfortunately, I think yeah. that's the that's the better way to um yeah. So to come back to, to the Star Wars thing, where, where good, I'm glad you, get, you remembered. Yeah, yeah. Because we do get criticized uh, partly for the, for the for the same reason. And so what you know, what we did was we give people this sort of uh, clip from uh, Revenge of the Sith. And so Anakin Skywalker, you know, spoiler alert, he goes on to become Darth Vader. He's talking to Obi-Wan Kenobi. And, um, you know, so he's about to join the dark side. And so Obi-Wan, so Darth Vader kind of says to Obi-Wan, you know, either you're with me or you're my enemy. And then Obi-Wan says, you know, only a Sith deals in absolutes. And the bad the baddies are the Sith in this. Uh, and then the narrator says, you know, don't join the dark sides. Um, um, watch out for false dilemmas. And then, and then we explain the false, the false dilemma technique that's often used in propagandistic uh, rhetoric. Um, and then, you know, we, we sort of test people with like real examples from social media, like, or if you're pro-Israel, you're anti-Gaza, or if you're pro-Gaza, uh, you're anti-Israel, or if, uh, if during school mm -hmm. shootings, like if you don't support automatic rifles, you're against the, uh, the Second Amendment. Um, and the, the goal mm -hmm. of these false dilemmas, obviously, right, is to take away all nuance and pretend there's all, only two options, while in fact there's many more, and that radicalizes people. But, you know, that works well, we find, on social media with millions of people, because they find it funny uh, to, to, you know, the Star Wars template is, that's the weakened dose, right? It's the exact same structure as the actual examples, mm -hmm. but it's kind of the the, the non-threatening sort of context and you can scale that across millions of people but then of course you know one of the one of the criticisms you get is that we're not changing people's minds on specific issues which is often what the i think what the progressives likes to see right okay but you know you're teaching people false dilemmas but uh, they're not endorsing climate change or vaccination or or, or you know transgender rights and uh, and it's sort of a, well right. it doesn't happen that way right you have to empower people to discern manipulation techniques and then they can make up their own mind. Um, and it's sort of, it's kind of a different, it's a different step, right? C certainly you can try to persuade people to believe in in, in certain facts and, and evidence. But I think the first, the first thing we need to do is empower people to spot these radicalization techniques. And here I'll tell you why this, why this story is relevant. When, when we try this out on conspiracy theories, I mean, the, in the vaccination analogy, we want to protect people who are not exposed yet, right? You're, you're, you know, we're not going to convince that you're a cranky uncle at the dinner table, but it's for everyone else who's who's present. But when you do talk to the conspiracy people, they don't engage with fact checks. They don't trust fact checkers. They don't trust scientists. But they don't like what they don't like is manipulation. And so when they hear yeah. about the sort of, you know, learning about manipulation techniques using non-political examples, they're intrigued. 
um, they're willing to accept it. Uh, if you go further, they might reject it and say, well, well no, I, you know, climate change is a hoax or, you know, vac you know, vaccines are a plot to make profit. But they're 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 at least willing to come on board with step one and learn about these techniques. And, you know, often I will use the example of Alex Jones. I said, look, this guy has told people for decades that Sandy Hook was crisis actors. And then he admitted in court that it was all, you know, made up and it isn't true. And, and um, you know, we don't want to be manipulated and duped by people who don't have our best interests in mind. And that seems to to resonate with them and make them more willing to, to engage. And, and yeah, maybe it's not enough. Um, but that got me to my final question for you is when I was listening to the show, I was thinking, well, in some ways, this whole show is kind of a vaccination. Like you get a, a weakened dose of, of the conspiracy theories. It's weakened because you, you know, you, you sort of apply a little counter pressure. It, it, it doesn't get too crazy. It's contained. Uh, using mm -hmm. maybe rules from the BBC that we can't just be spreading misinformation. Um, and, you know, you talk through the narrative in a very uh, non-political, polite way and it allows people uh, to sort of hear a more nuanced way of thinking about it and maybe even immunize themselves from um, from falling for these things in the future. And maybe you're like, well, that's that's not how I would see the show. Uh, but that's kind of what what occurred to me. And, in, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in because uh, we use a lot of things from popular media as our interventions, like we could use your show, your podcast in an experiment, see if people become more resistant to conspiracy theories after listening to the show. Right. So you should so it you is should do some. Yeah, you should do some A-B testing, like have me and Louis Theroux and see who's better at de-radicalizing people. Coming back to the front of me example, we'll set that up. <laughs> right. For me, it's about, I, I, I mean, my main motivation is just telling human stories. Sure. I just think people connect to, you know, I was at the Stephen Pinker event the other day and, mm -hmm. and um, somebody asked him, you know, how, you know, everybody in this room probably feels the same way. How do you reach people outside of this room? And he gave his answers. And I was thinking if I was on the stage, what I'd be saying now is human stories, because human stories, you know, that twist and turn are just by their very nature, more nuanced, they're easier to connect to. So I think of things fell apart as, as being human stories. And, and I think it may have the same, hopefully it will have the same positive impact as what you said about you know, a sort of weakened version of um, but 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 for me, it's just all about yeah, telling telling complicated gray area human stories. Yeah, and I think I think the reason why I tend to be immune to those sort of culture war pylons is because I stick to human stories, and and it's hard for people to to get angry if you're if you're telling a, a nuanced story like that. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, but it's hard for people mm -hmm. to stick to the nuance when under pressure. And I think that's that's a skill that's mm -hmm. hard to develop, to, to remain nuanced, well, to I, remain open-minded. Well, well, I'll tell you what, before we get cut off, I, it's easier now for me. I think it's easier now than it was a couple of years ago. I, I do think, you know, the flame isn't burning. You know, if I say something, if, you know, one of the episodes of, of the series was about, about the concept creep of trauma. And right. that's something that I would have been, that's a pretty right wing argument, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I would have been scared to say that a couple of years ago, I'd, scared of being piled in on, but I wasn't now, and nothing bad happened as a result of me bringing out that episode about trauma, nobody did pile in on me, and I got a couple, one or two slightly grumpy you know, People, messages, yeah. No, nothing, mm -hmm. yeah, but nothing more than that. So I actually think things are calming down in general when it comes to talking about these issues than, than 2016, yeah. 2017. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a final thing uh, before we get uh, cut off, if we have the, 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 the time. You know, coming back to the sort of human interest um, story, you know, in the research community, we talk to doctors on the front line who tell us about, you know, anecdotes, people dying because of conspiracies. But, you know, when, when, when you do this sort of quantitative research, you know, the, the, the average is often not so extreme. And so people often say, well, what should we be telling these sort of um, stories about extreme extremists and extreme rabbit holes? given that, you know, that's not most people. And it made me think about, you know, mm -hmm. people who read the BBC and listen to BBC shows are probably not the people um, who, you know, who are um, sort of radicalized and, and uh, are buying into extreme conspiracy theories. 
Um, so maybe these stories mm -hmm. are, are interesting, especially because they seem uh, different. Um, yeah. but, but, but they filter, but I tell you what, they but they filter out. So for instance, I've done some interviews. I, so one of, one of the interviews that I did um, to publicise things fell apart was with Reason, with Nick Gillespie for Reason, yeah. which is a libertarian podcast. Now, I think most of the people who listen to, to Reason um, are reasonable, rational, sort of heterodoxy. Sure. But I'd say you also get the odds, you know, um, you know, more right wing, libertarian type type sure. of person. So actually, even if not, even if the, the more, you know, sort of extreme people aren't listening to things fell apart, they might then listen. You know, if I'm doing interviews on, in places like Reason, as I say, most of the people who listen to Reason were are reasonable people. But I think, you know, you might get a few. So, so it filters out. It can filter out that way. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting um, uh, hypothesis. Yeah. Um, yeah. And certainly, you know, I think it's important to shed light on um, on what's going on in, in in other segments of our culture and uh, you know in other parts of, uh, of of the human experience because they're they're all unique to to some extent and and stories are mm -hmm. um, are important. Um, but um, yeah, well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So yeah, you know, thanks so much for uh, for talking to me. And um, it was uh, I think it was really illuminating. Mm -hmm.